Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our triumphant Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Death and life, guilt and innocence, condemnation and redemption are words and themes which will resound in your ears, wrestle in your minds, and settle into your hearts this week. Welcome to Holy Week. Today, we stand at the entrance to the conclusion of the cosmic battle for the soul of mankind. Jesus, in our gospel reading today, just after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, lays out what is to come in powerful and sweeping language. The stage is set. The hour has come, Jesus declares, as he is in Jerusalem. But the hour for what? The complete satisfaction of God's righteous wrath. The suffering and death of the only innocent human who has ever lived. The grace that swallows up death in victory. Each event of the hour is fueled by a love so preposterously undeserved. No one yet knows, even his own disciples, what Jesus is willingly walking into in Jerusalem. Welcome to Holy Week. Place yourselves for a moment in this particular time of our gospel reading this morning. We already started this by having a parade and waving the palm branches just as the people did back then and singing all glory, laud, and honor, Hosanna in the highest. This moment is glorious. Jesus, the man who many believe to be the Messiah, has come to Jerusalem, the city of God. Did you hear? He raised a guy named Lazarus from the dead. And it was after he was dead for multiple days. He's incredible. Have you heard him speak? He's so wise and knowledgeable. Oh, you weren't here earlier? So many people greeted him when he came into the city, and they followed him as he came in. It was almost like a king had come to the Jerusalem. Something big is about to go down. Something big is about to happen. I don't know what, but I can just feel it. Yet none of the people present really knew the big thing that was to come. In fact, even though they thought it was as big as overthrowing their Roman oppressors, that doesn't even compare to the great work that God was about to do. In fact, they don't know that what happens next determines the fate of all people in every time place. They don't know that the most heinous act of evil is about to be committed and the most glorious act of love at the same time in all time and place forever will occur in this next week. Welcome to Holy Week. And so enter a few Greeks seeking Jesus at the beginning of our gospel reading because even they, even the Gentiles in Jerusalem, know something is going on. They know that something big is happening. Now, these Greeks, they weren't total outsiders because they were going up to celebrate this religious feast. They were what are called the proselytes at the gate or the proselytes of righteousness. They were people who have turned away from idolatrous paganism and started to adapt some of the religious practices of the Jewish faith. But they weren't fully accepted in the synagogue yet. But they know something's happening. Jesus is here. And they desire to see Jesus. And they ask his disciples to introduce them. And their introduction encourages Jesus to express and proclaim really the first ever introduction to what is about to happen in Jerusalem. In this city, in this particular time and place that is going to affect the entire universe for eternity. Because they are also Gentiles, and the hour has come for their fates to be changed forever by Jesus Christ. It's almost as if Jesus, Jesus, touched by their inquiry, is reminded to proclaim the new thing that he is starting this next week. So what has the Son of Man come to do? Well, Jesus uses agricultural imagery possibly to appeal to anyone 
who is listening, not just the Jews, but anyone who's in Jerusalem, to decide to describe what he is about to endure and what it's for. He says that a seed, unless it goes into the earth and dies, remains alone. But if it dies, it bears many fruit. But Jesus also reveals in his next words the two sides that are going to be at play, at war with one another, this big happening that is to come in Jerusalem. The Son of Man is to be glorified. That's where Jesus' answers start. But how exactly is that going to happen? Well, if you look at the seed imagery, it is through death that the Son of Man will be glorified. The death that Jesus is going to die. Now, nobody listening yet understands what Jesus is saying, for they think that he has come to overthrow the earthly oppressors, to establish an earthly kingdom that will reign but Jesus is here for so much more. The fruits described as a result of the death of the seed are you and me, are those of faith all across the world. For we would not have been made the fruit of Christ if we had not first endured what is to come. And why would he do that? He also gives us an insight into this. He says, unless the seed goes into the earth and dies, it remains alone forever. Think about that for a moment. Apart from what Christ is about to do in Jerusalem, come eternity, he's by himself. No one escapes the wrath of God. But he doesn't want that. For the hour has come to do the thing that avoids that fate entirely and creates this many fruit. And lastly, this life in this world makes up one side, and Christ and eternal life makes up the other. He's letting them know this isn't a Jesus versus the Romans thing. It isn't you versus the outsiders. It's the world as you know it versus God. A battle which the world has no hope of winning until Christ comes along. And he demonstrates this by saying, whoever loves his life loses it. It's an odd statement for Jesus to say. Probably puzzling to hear at first. Whoever loves his life loses it. What does he mean by that? Well, the Greek word for love here used is phileo, which is affection, attachment, friendship, brotherly love. There's a city I hear in this state called Philadelphia. That's where that term comes from. The city of brotherly love comes from phileo, love in this sense. So what Jesus is really saying here is all of you who have an attachment to this life, who cling to this life, will end up losing your life. Then he says, whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The word for hate here is meseo. And that means to detest or persecute. Because Jesus has been quite clear that there's a part of you that is not good. That part of you that clings to this life is something you should not embrace, but detest. Something you wish to be freed from. For that is what he has come to do. You see, before Christ comes along, the scriptures tell us what our state is. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, irreparably broken and enslaved. That is the part of us that wants to cling to this life. And Christ is calling us to despise that part of us, to reject that part of us and cling to something else. Because there's only two sides in what is to come. There's only two sides in this fight that is about to happen and about to be won. And he wants you on the right side. So this war between these two forces is about to hit its highest point. That is what is going to happen in Jerusalem. That's the big happening that no one really fully understands quite yet. It's even bigger 
than a great war in the midst of the Roman Empire with all the Roman legions descending on the city of Jerusalem. It is the cosmic powers of good, of evil, light, and darkness, the conflict settled once and for all. For this purpose I have come to this hour, Jesus says. Now here we see a vulnerable moment of Jesus' humanity. For he says that his soul is troubled because he knows of all the people gathered there listening to him, he's the only one who knows what's really going to happen. What this hour demands, the price that must be paid. But he says, should I ask the Father to take me away from this? No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. Think about that for a moment. That means that from the very beginning of the plan of salvation, Jesus knew why he was here. When he says, for this very purpose I have come to this hour, he's not referring just to coming to Jerusalem, but the whole incarnation enterprise together. For this purpose I have come to this hour. So dear friends in Christ, in this next week we are going to see what God intended from the very beginning to fix what Adam and Eve and the devil broke all those years ago in the Garden of Eden. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name, Jesus cries out. And God's voice thunders in response, and we're told that the people don't really hear the words that are said. They just hear a sound, a thundering, and they think that it's God speaking to Jesus. But Jesus tells them that voice has come for your sake, not for mine. For I know what is to come that you still do not. Why is that voice coming for our sake? Because he goes on and says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Why is that for our sake? Because that's the side we're on without Jesus. We're on the side of this world. At the head of our army is the ruler of this world who's aligned himself against God and has dragged us with him. But now he faces judgment. Now the world faces judgment. A judgment our Lord seeks to spare you from. He seeks to spare me from and all of those listening to Jesus in the city of Jerusalem. And he demonstrates his desire to gather all of these people to himself when he says, And when I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw people, all people to myself. The price that Jesus is about to pay, the victory that he's about to win in this battle, comes at high cost. The death of the Son of God, his innocent suffering and mocking at the hands of those he seeks to save, but victory is his. And in that victory, he draws all people to himself. This is the great spreading of the Christian faith. The covenant between God and his people is no longer bound to just the people in the Old Testament and their lineage. But now in Christ, all those who are gathered by his death and resurrection are clinging to a new side. They're clinging to Christ. And as usual, this comes with a warning. The light is only here a little while longer. You will see light and darkness vying for victory this week. If you come to Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, you'll see the themes of dark and light back and forth. And at some point, it seems like the darkness has won, and the silence, and there is no joyous singing or parades of celebration. But the darkness doesn't get the last word. The light does. Because Christ is victorious. Now when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Big things are happening. But even bigger than they or you and I can imagine. Now, this is the last time that Jesus publicly preaches.
before his death. This is the last time he addresses anyone other than his inner circle of disciples before his passion, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. For all that needed to be spoken from God has been spoken. And yet still, we do not believe. As you enter into Holy Week, this is what is happening. The ultimate battle for your own soul for eternity. What is Jesus' message for you today, this Palm Sunday, in John chapter 12? His plea to you and throughout his whole earthly ministry has been cling to me. I'm going to draw you to myself. Cling to me. He withdraws from public view and remains only with his disciples because what needs to be said has been said. What is going to be done is going to be done. And when it is, he will draw all people to himself. The Father has been glorified through the incarnation of Jesus and the message of the gospel he has proclaimed, and he will be glorified again when the plan of his salvation fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus. I chose the words, cling to Christ carefully, because it is not you who grab on to him, but he who draws you to himself. It is not you who have chosen him, like the crowd who's listening to Jesus say all of these things. They have no clue what's really going on. And they won't have any clue, including the disciples, until it is revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Dear friends in Christ, what's been revealed to you by the Holy Spirit is the truth of what happens in Holy Week. Is the truth that God loves you so much he sent Jesus to be lifted up to suffer the just wrath of God fully in your place, to draw you to himself, cling to him. Because Jesus makes it clear there are only two sides to this conflict. There's no safe third place. You're either with Christ or you're with the world. And now the judgment of this world is upon us. Now the ruler of this world is going to be defeated, and all those with him. Because you see, the fate of this world is the li- in life is the cross and no Easter. It is the darkness and silence of Good Friday with no victorious joy afterward. God does not want that. For if the seed does not go into the earth and die, it remains alone forever. For some unknown reason God loves you and me his great desire is not to be alone forever but to be forever with you think about that for a moment you know who you are and God knows you even better than that and still he wishes to spend forever with you so much so that Jesus, knowing what awaits him in the city of Jerusalem, goes forth willingly anyway. That is the great work of this week, the great battle that is taking place, the hour that has come, is that Christ takes that fate, the fate of this world, the fate that ends at the cross with no victorious resurrection upon himself, the fate forsaken by God. He suffers the complete death of this life fully in our place, all to give us new life. You were baptized into this death of Jesus and new life of the resurrection. Because when Jesus gathered you to himself, we are leaving behind the fate of this world, the judgment of God, and coming into the new life the resurrection from the dead, the life eternal, forgiveness of sins, perfection forever with Jesus. All of that was won for you this week through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Big things are happening. Bigger than you can imagine.
cling to Christ who has drawn you to himself. Welcome to Holy Week. In the name of Jesus. Amen.